Welcome to Musawa's Parallel Event at CSW66. We are delighted to welcome you here today. As I said, my name is Huda Jawad and I am the co-director of Musawa, the global movement for equality in the Muslim family. In February of this year, we turned 13. Um, you can find out more about us and the work that we do by visiting our website and social media channels. Right, well, we have an amazing panel of speakers for you today on a very provocative and central topic of discussion, which has in effect engaged activists, politicians, economists, lawmakers, and clerics, men and women, in complex and at times conflicting and hostile positions for decades. Um, so what we promise you is a very engaging um, discussion. But before we start, I would like us to do some housekeeping. So perhaps we could put up the housekeeping slide for everyone to share and see. Wait for the team to do that. In the meantime, I'm just going through the chat. Hello, Shireen. Welcome everyone. Uh, Russia, could you share the housekeeping screen, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. So just to reiterate, this session is a public event um, and we will be recording it. It's, as you already know, it, as you've walked in or walked in virtually, it will be, um, have been, uh, you'll see that it's the, the note to say that the seminar is being recorded. The language that we will be operating in is English, but we do have Arabic translation and Arabic interpretation, so please use that. Um, also, we will have um, a question and answer uh, uh, session at, towards the end of the seminar. Um, please use the question um, and answer option in Zoom to, um, to put your questions forward and we will pass them on to the speakers um, when it's time to open up for discussion. I think there's some kind of uh, the, the, the slide refers to in, in Bahasa being used um, and Facebook, I think uh, for this uh, event, that's not possible, um, but we will definitely be putting it on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to look at that in, in later. We will be putting on resources and links in the chat. So please feel free to use them. Um, thank you, you can put the, uh, you can stop sharing the screen. Great, now that it's clear, we can turn to our esteemed panel to begin our conversation. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to our trailblazers today. Um, uh, in no particular order, um, I would like to introduce you to Marwa Sharafuddin. Marwa is an Egyptian scholar and activist. She is a senior advisor in Musawa and a visiting fellow at Harvard Law School's program for law and society in the Muslim world. Her scholarly and activist work covers the intersection between Islamic law, international human rights law and feminist activism. She has been published in a number of academic books and journals and has appeared on media platforms covering these topics and others. She co-founded and or served on the advisory boards of several feminist organizations worldwide, such as Musawa, the Global Fund for Women, the Young Arab Feminist Network, and the Network for Women's Rights Organizations in Egypt. She totally believes in the power of art for social transformation and is a writer, story collector, and a performer in her own right. Thank you for joining us, Marwa. Ziba Mir Husseini is our second esteemed uh, speaker. Ziba is a legal anthropologist specializing in Islamic law, gender, and development. She's also a founding member of Musawa. Ziba is the 2015 recipient of the American Academy of Religions Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. Currently, she is Professorial Research Associate at the Center for Islamic and Middle Eastern Law, University of London. She is a co-editor of several authoritative works, including the upcoming Justice and Beauty in Muslim Marriage Towards Egalitarian Ethics and Law, which will be out later this year, Men in Charge, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition, uh, Gender and Equality in Muslim Family Law, Justice and Ethics in the Islamic Legal Tradition, and her most recent and exciting work is Journeys Towards 
Gender Equality in Islam, which is being released in a couple of weeks this April. So watch out for the launch event for that. I am also very delighted to bring you Nehla Haidar today. Nehla has been a very active member of the field of human rights work and has held several senior positions in an international organization. Currently, as you all know, she is the vice chairperson of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and director of the Regional Bureau for Arab States. She's also been involved with Arab Lawyers Union as a member of the Special Committee on Women and Sharia, as well as the Arab Organization for Human Rights. Nahla will be leaving us um, uh, Th two thirds of the way through the seminar, unfortunately, because she has many events to attend in her capacity as vice chairperson, but we are delighted that she's joining us for the time being and cannot wait for her conversations. Uh, last but not least, Hala al karib is an activist and research practitioner who works in the Horn of Africa and Sudan region, focusing on gender justice, democracy, challenging religious and cultural dogma. She's also the regional director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa, and she is also a very important member of our board. Um, so we have together a powerhouse of a panel for you um, to begin our discussion. Um, so thank you all for being here today, both uh, uh, members of um, the webinar public and also our esteemed panel. Right, well, as you all know, that there is no denying that both religion and economic capital are some of the favored tools of patriarchy and the powerful. I would even argue that they, when used together, these two are even more potent and harmful. So in our uh, discussion, I'd like us to go straight in um, and ask uh, my, put my question to Ziba. Ziba, what is the dynamic in Muslim contexts? How does it work? What is the place of the Muslim family laws in practice um, and in theory, and how do they relate to the empowerment of women, in your opinion? Thank you, Hoda, and thank you for the kind introduction. We are talking about the challenges that women face in Muslim contexts related to economic empowerment. And I want to say these challenges are not unique in Muslim context. They have existed or still exist everywhere as part of a larger political struggle for social justice, democracy, pluralism, and freedom of expression. I say this because we need to see these challenges as part of a larger str struggle that is still going on all over the world. But there is one thing that is specific to Muslim context, and that is the fact that this struggle for economic justice, which is part of the equality for women, is embedded in the intimate links between religion and politics. And religious knowledge, based on interpretations of Islam's sacred texts, Please note that I don't say Islam. Interpretations of Islam's sacred text plays a very inter essential role. So in other words, this struggle for equality, economic justice in Muslim context has a theological roots. That is how the texts are understood. And also it is political and it is really I find it really difficult to separate them, to say when polit uh, theology ends and politics start. They are very much intertwined. And why? I, uh, because interpretations of the te these texts not only govern marriage and gender relations, but also are the source of family law. Marwa will be talking about how it works within family law. But what I want to do here is just say a few words about the concept, a juristic concept that gives men economic power over women in both theoretical 
and uh, practical framework. And this concept, you know, as we will see, is a, a plays an organizing uh, is acts as an or organizing principle, and that, as all we know, is the concept of kawama, male guardianship over women. And this concept is based on a theological assumption. And that assumption is God has given men authority over women. And this assumption is justified by reference to a Quranic verse. And that is verse 434 of um, uh, Surah Al-Nisa. And, uh, and is encapsulated in uh, two legal concepts. One is Qawama and another one is Velaya. Both of them um, uh, convey the notion of male guardianship. Qawama during the marriage and Velaya before the marriage and after marriage. And in time, what I want to say that we have done a research uh, a project which finished about three years ago it, uh, in Mosava uh, on Kawama and Velaya. And we were interested to in understand that where these concepts are coming from, how they were constructed, and what is the role of this concept in everyday life of women. And in short, what I can say that these two concepts can be called as DNA of patriarchy in Muslim legal tradition. Please note that I'm not saying Islam in Islam or in Sharia, but I say in Islamic legal tradition, because we need to separate the knowledge about Islamic legal uh, text at interpretations, this um, uh, concept are based on interpretation from what uh, Islam says. So um, this is um, the whole concept of Qawama, to understand it, we really need to look at the marriage contract. And classical jurists define marriage contract as a contract of exchange. And uh, that puts women under the Qawama of men. And this here, Qawama has an element of protection and also with protection always comes domination. Mm -hmm. And and what uh, it, it, um, the, 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 the rulings about marriage can, we can say revolve on two poles. One is that men provide, mm -hmm. therefore they have power and women uh obey mm -hmm. and 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 these concepts are really i'm not saying that these are what the quran says but this is how it, it is understood and uh, interpreted in laws so family laws what we have as family laws have a very fixed and i would say essentialist notion of roles and this essentialist notion is still in our current laws, that men are the head of the household because they provide, their earnings matter, um, and also takes precedence, and, and also they have a larger share in inheritance. But the point is that this concept are based on assumptions and interpretations because any legal ruling, any law that we have behind it, there is a set of assumptions. And but at the same time, because they take their legitimacy and validity from Islam's sacred text, they matter a lot. Therefore, for any feminist project, for any project that wants to establish egalitarian construct of family relations and marriage on the basis of partnership, partnership of equals, we need to engage with these concepts. And that is what did, we did in Musava and our material is available and you, we can look at it and uh, you can search it. And, uh, there is no time to talk about it, but it is important to deconstruct and understand this concept. And this takes me to the second point, which is my final point. And one thing that we really need when we 
approach Islam sacred text is to understand uh, two things. One is that uh, approach Islam sacred text, and especially when we want to say what Islam says about women, there are two elements that are important. And one is, and all of them are based on assumptions, these two elements. One is that assumptions about gender uh, and equality in Islam, as any other religion, are necessarily social cult cultural constructs. That is, they historically came into existence and they are subject to change and negotiation. And therefore, we cannot say Islam says this or Sharia says this. It is always an interpretation and which is based on assumptions. And we need to look at this assumption carefully. But one th this is now known because, you know, we all know that, uh, that gender is a construction. It's a social construction. And it came uh, into existence in a historical context, and it's not fixed. But there is another, uh, this, I would say, the same kind of uh, um, notion applies to the interpretation of Islam's sacred texts and rulings that derive from, there, from uh, them, because they are also shaped by interaction with ideological, political, economic forces, and people's experience and um, expectations. So they are also open to negotiation, this understanding. And uh, there is a tension in Islam's sacred text between egalitarian, uh, ethical egalitarianism as an essential part of Islam's message. Justice is extraordinarily important in the Quran. But the Quran does not define justice, uh, but gives us the direction to justice. And, and also, mm, uh, the fact is that this tension, this tension enables or makes also the Islam sacred uh, takes a train, a field for contestation. So those who want to argue for gender equality can rely on the Quran, can rely on Islamic texts to make a case for their demand and uh, legitimize it through the uh, Islam. And those who are arguing for um, on opposing gender equality also can do that. And uh, I, I say this because I want to emphasize that because of the important role of religion in our culture, in our life, in our legal system, it is important to engage with it. It is important to understand it. And so for a f uh, and now we have a critical mass of Muslim feminist scholars who have shown us the equality, how the Quran can be understood, how Islamic legal tradition can be understood and constructed in an egalitarian way. And why? Because in our time and in our context, there can be no justice without equality. At the time that the classical juries derived the rulings from the Quran and created and defined marriage contract, the concept of equality, the way that we think about it, was not there. And it was, if it was there, it was not part of the uh, conceptions of justice, but it is now. And uh, in the second part, um, after listening to all, I can uh, talk about how this is done with reference to what, how we approach it in Musawa, and what are the parts open to us uh, to work within uh, within the religious uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you, Ziba. That, 
that was absolutely clear and you were very very uh, careful to point out the difference between what is a given belief and what is an interpretation of that and also the impact of the social economic and political factors in the context that we operated in the interpretation of these various you know crucial concepts and i love the idea of a the dna of patriarchy because it's something that once used as a model and a framework can really enable us to see the wood from the trees as it were Thank you. Um, Marwa, I'd like to turn to you. You are a seasoned uh, practitioner in this work and have extensive, extensive uh, experience in mapping how such religious concepts and ideas um, kind of map out or translate in legal frameworks and adopted in Muslim countries. Um, can you tell us what um, kind of guide us through how uh, using these concepts and the combination of their application in real life makes it so that men end up getting the money and women are actively excluded. Thank you. Sure, let me jump straight in. And I wanna give you a taster of some of the laws that we find uh, in our Muslim context that govern issues related to women's economic empowerment. But aren't we talking about economic empowerment here? So I'm supposed to be talking about labor laws, work policies, I'm not. I'm actually going to talk about family laws. Right. And why am I doing this? It's because from our own experience, but also an increasing body of very credible research is showing us that there is a very, very strong link between family laws, not just in Muslim contexts all over the world and women's economic empowerment. In fact, and I wanna check that you're seeing my screen here. Um, I think if you need to turn it into slide show, then we can be, cause we're not on slide three, we're on slide one, that's what we see. That, that's okay. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. Okay. And so I, I was saying that family law is actually very, very important for women's economic empowerment, not just in Muslim context. In fact, a cross country um, study that has uh, looked at countries all over the world has come to the conclusion that egalitarian reform of family law may be the most crucial precondition for empowering women economically. And that's why I'm looking at family law. In Muslim contexts, when we talk about family law, we have to talk about religion in most Muslim contexts, the absolute majority. And so let's look at this. This is the logic of my presentation. I need to look at religion. And we heard from Dr. Zima Mir Hosseini that religion, we can look into it with patriarchal eyes and create patriarchal interpretations of it, or we can look with egalitarian eyes and create Inter accordingly egalitarian interpretations of it. My first half of the intervention, I'm gonna look at when we look at religion from a patriarchal lens, and then we create Muslim family laws that govern us, that have the very strong, powerful arms of the state reaching into our bedrooms, our homes, our workplaces, yeah? What happens to women's economic empowerment? And I have a sad face here to show you, or give you a taster of what's coming about. Okay, so very quickly, I want to take a look at some of the legal uh, rulings we find in Muslim family laws in most countries, Muslim countries or contexts, that do affect greatly women's economic empowerment. Number one, obedience. In most of these Muslim family laws, that are based on a human interpretation. Okay, wow. there's a difference between. Can yes. you can you go down to the slide? That I did. That. Oh no, we're still on the first page. Oh, okay. Yeah. How about now? No, still on the first page. Maybe stop share and go back again. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. All right. Sorry to stop you mid flow. No, no, it's okay. Hanging on there, waiting for what was to come. <laughs> All right. I just hope it's not being taken from my time. Oh. Can you see it now? We're still seeing page one, slide one. Uh, it's that not strange. Yeah. Hmm. If you go to the bottom of the screen on your right hand side, there should be a slideshow icon. I do. I do. Yeah. I, I, I'm so sorry about that. Let me try one final time. And if not, uh, then I'm going to move on so we don't take more time. Yeah. All right. Actually, if I don't do slideshow, maybe it's it's gonna work. Maybe. How about now? Woo! Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Risk to making it slideshow. Okay, so the first issue that greatly affects women's economic empowerment in Muslim contexts because of the family law is the issue of obedience. And Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini gave us a taster of where does this come from? It comes from a human interpretation of a certain Quranic verse that did not have to end up obligating women to obey their husbands. But it turns out we, as Muslim governments, took this particular interpretation of the verse and said women have to obey their husbands in our Muslim family laws. What implications does, does that have? For women's economic empowerment, a woman for her to even work, she needs her husband's permission for her to be able to travel to a conference, to a meeting, work meeting, she has to get that permission. And of course, that greatly affects her economic empowerment. Second point is male guardianship. Again, same verse, same concept of qawama that was humanly constructed in a patriarchal way and then translated into laws where we find that women, because of that issue, this understanding of male guardianship, that males have, a, have the power of guardianship over women in Muslim family laws, it severely restricts women's ability to sign contracts, take loans from banks, for example, conduct financial transactions and so on without the permission of the male guardian. And of course, that male guardian is usually recognized as the head of household. Now, uh, the other issue is unpaid domestic and care work. Even though in Islamic jurisprudence, a woman is not obliged, it's not part of her duties to take care of the household, nor to raise the kids, nor to do any of that. Yet, we are finding that in some Muslim family laws and the social norms as well, they I'm sorry, the arrows went all wonky here. It's all right. Um, oblige women with this kind of work. But what, does, what do we know from the research and from reality is that the more women spend doing unpaid work inside the home, the less they're able to have time to go out and work for paid uh, salaries. The Arab world, as an example, we have the highest rate of unpaid work inside the home done by women in the whole world, by the way. Surprise, surprise. And so we have the lowest employment rate of women in the whole world, because there is a correlation between these two, all right? Fourth is that in most of these Muslim family laws, not all of them, because I'm gonna give you examples of the good ones, most of them do not regulate at all shared matrimonial assets. So what we're doing is we're telling women, stay inside of the home, do all this work for free, you're not gonna get paid, and even if you get divorced and the, or the husband dies, you're still not gonna get a result uh, for your time and effort for the work that you did, all right? Fifth point, post-divorce financial rights. They could be very good under Muslim family law, but the problem is the laws are completely outdated. The sums given to women as part of their post-divorce financial rights are substandard. They're below the poverty line. And finally, the inheritance issue. In Muslim family law, a woman inherits half of what a man inherits. And there was a very logical reason why that happened 1,400 years ago, because the man was the one who was supposed to spend on all the female kin of the family, not just the wife and the kids. Fast forward 1,400 years ago, that's not happening anymore. Men are inheriting double the share, but they're not spending it now on the female kin, and there is no accountability mechanism for that. Now, I want you to take a step back, please. Take a look at this slide. This slide is the perfect plan for the impoverishment of a certain group, making sure that the money never ends, in the hands, ends up in the hands of this group. Of course, women. Now, that's not the intention of Muslim family law, nor of Sharia. Definitely, far from it. And let's be very clear about that. But this is the reality we are living in today. And so I want to look at the results of this reality. I want to, did you see the next slide about the World Bank? Okay, I'm exiting the slideshow. You're supposed to see it now, hopefully. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. the problem is with the slideshow. So the World Bank Women in Business and Law Reports, they look at the economic empowerment of women by assessing certain abilities of women in each country. The first one is her ability to get a job, be head of household, sign contracts freely, open bank accounts, and register her business without the husband's permission. Can we look please at the result of this assessment for 2021? 
look at the last 25 countries. There are two blue dots there. The last 25 countries that assess women's economic empowerment worldwide, 22 of these countries have Muslim family laws in place. This is economics, okay? But it has a relationship with Muslim family law. Now, does that mean that Islam disempowers women economically? No, it doesn't. What it means is that our interpretation of Islamic Sharia, because it came through a patriarchal lens, a patriarchal eye, ended up in this economic situation. All right. And so the question is, is there a way out of this situation? And I say, absolutely. There is a way out of the situation using the same Islamic framework to find solutions that empower women economically. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about in my next intervention. Thank you. Wow, Marwa, that was searingly clear and enraging at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think the combination of your presentation and, Z uh, um, and Ziba's really makes clear the, the problem. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear what comes next. Um, thank you for that. Right, and now I'd like to turn to Nahla. Nahla, I am really thrilled that you are with us today. Um, and despite all the challenges that you've gone through in order to get to this space today, I'm really, really glad that you are here. Okay. Having heard the outline of the challenges um, and the implementation and use of religious interpretive doctrine faced uh, by women um, and that are subjected to economic disadvantage and through your own um, work and uh, your own understanding, um, how does someone like you in a senior, a senior leader in an international human rights structure strategically work with this situation and in these circumstances? Um, what role, role, if any, does a secular human rights framework um, and a, a body like the UN uh, can play in this situation? Thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all, all of you. I'm very, very happy to be here. And I want to thank you. Oh, the sound is like a And to all of you, the new leadership and welcome you, Huda. And uh, I'm really very happy to be uh, among the, the, this group of friends. Uh, what I wanted to do. Two presentation of Ziba, which I cherish a lot, her and I've, I've learned a lot from her work in the past few years of my association with Sidao, uh, and from Marwa with her practitioner view and perspective, and uh, that she will never take no for an answer, which is something I really value her for as well. Uh, I think that we are tackling here um, an issue not so much of the just from the secular perspective versus the non. Concept. What we are really tackling is uh, how do we promote women's reach in, in all contexts and who are the players? Mm -hmm. I think they were alluded to and then... Sorry, would you, you mind me turning, turn your video off? Possibly the sound and the connection might work better because you're lagging and you're stopping. So okay. I'm stopping could... the... Uh, no, no, not the not the the microphone, just the video. If you could turn your camera Could off. You, can you, yes, can you hear me now? No. Hello. Hi. You can't. Uh, can you hear me now? I think if you kind of turn your camera off, it would be better. The bandwidth might be better. I know in Lebanon things are quite challenging right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Please. Turned off my camera. Great. Well, we can, can you still hear me see now? That's Okay. Good. Yes. So yes, yes. I don't want to. Re yes, I don't. Oh, no. We've lost her. We'll try and see if we can get Nahla back. Nahla. Okay. There you I want it. I want 
teacher's perspective, something about economic empowerment, because everything that was said is correct and is being acted upon by the society that you refer to when they come to the dialogue with SIDA, we see how much the, the egalitarian approach makes a difference and the, the patriarchal lens uh, uh, puts a blockage. And we are addressing the issue of stereotype as well. not limited to to society in context. Stereotypes are really, really very hard not to crack and to change. And uh, we, we try to put the emphasis uh, so more in Muslim society about women's right to exercise commerce, about women's right to have its own uh, money independent from the husband. These were real value that we have also forgotten about over time, and we've slipped in a way to more Western society, leaving the positive that we had and not gaining the positive that they have. So we find ourselves in a bit of awkward position. So uh, like, for instance, now I would like our, our societies uh, in the Muslim uh, countries to look more at Article 13 of SIDAO and not only be obsessed with Article uh, 16, because we can have a lot of gains with Article 13. Article 13 is at the heart of economic empowerment because it's about self-employment, it's about entrepreneurship, it's about a lot of things that Islamic culture does not preempt to the contrary. I mean, we always say uh, our mother Hadith uh, was a, a very uh, wealthy woman. She held uh, the Prophet she put her foot and it's looked at as a positive that women can be uh, entrepreneurs themselves, but we give up on that. We give up, as I said, we have turned into trying to, to, form, to, to look like Western society, neglecting what we have as positive and negative. So I would like us really to look much more at Article 13, to understand what is the right to family benefit. This is crucial because this is related to Article 16, ultimately, but not only. The access to resources, the access to land, the access to productivity. I mean, there are many more ways to be more focusing on, on empowerment economically of women than simply the traditional formal sector, which is also addressed and has been addressed in the two earlier presentation. But I wanted to seize this opportunity to open up this other avenue, because we know that a lot of the suffering of our women and their disempowerment from, from lack of social security, lack of pension benefit, these are not very visible issue, but these are what makes it or breaks it, what render them more vulnerable and less capable of becoming autonomous and going, be, especially that we know that many of these women uh, at this situation are single pa parents and they are carrying all the burden and yet they are not visible in their societies because they are not uh, in the formal employment sector. And uh, when they have a husband, uh, uh, and we know that this was touched upon by Marwa in the family law context about after divorce, what are the entitlements? But we know, for instance, how important it is that the, the women unpaid care work uh, at the end is not compensated through proper pension as well in divorce. So they find themselves again much more vulnerable. So, I think we need to do more work on this aspect of the economic empowerment than only the traditional uh, type, the, the classical type of employment that we, are, we should continue to work on, we should continue to seek equality in it, but we have an avenue, and I think I would invite all of you to look much more carefully at Article 13. There is a lot of potential in that article if we want to make a difference in, 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 the, in our societies, and it will not be resisted because it comes, uh, uh, it is in line with what we, we always pretend and preach that women, patrimoine is independent, that she doesn't have to put her asset at the disposal of the family, that she can dispose of her money, at least we speak up this way. But let's, let's see what do we make of these pluses in terms of effectiveness uh, on the ground? How can this really influence the position of women um, in, in terms of who gets the money. So I wanted to make this, these points just to open up a little bit our own thinking and say that 
within within these groups of uh, of women, we obviously have uh, 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 much more uh, to focus on the women who have experienced domestic and sexual violence. How do we uh, work with these women in terms of economic empowerment? They are, you know, target group that requires different uh, approaches. We have to look at refugee and asylum seeking women uh, also because they are much more vulnerable and they will not be able to um, to uh, stand on their own feet. We have to look at those who have experienced financial abuse. We have uh, we have to look at those who have no recourse to public funds. Mm. All of these uh, categories will give us better idea on how empowerment happens in each and every um, uh, uh, context. And in particular, of course, women who are caregivers, and these are 99% of the women that we're speaking about. In addition, we need to pay attention also uh, to, to women who require flexible working environments because of the same reason of child care responsibility or other caregiving uh, responsibility. So what is important to note also is that increasingly there is a um, recognition by the committee, by CEDAW, that uh, austerity measures, if one can say uh, like a uh, uh, situation of crisis, whether financial or pandemic or even a disaster, mm -hmm. they are much. They have much more impact on disempowering women mm -hmm. economically. And if we apply that in the context of uh, Muslim countries, or uh, we see that majority of women either either in conflict or uh, suffering more acutely from the crisis, and then so that we need a much more particular uh, uh, strategies to address that because they they become much 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 more vulnerable. I don't know. I think I have exceeded the time that I was uh, allotted and I wanted to stop here and I regret because I will not be with you in the second part. But I just wanted to open this additional avenue for reflection on empowerment so that we capitalize on all the fantastic work that you've been doing, uh, Ziba in her own way, Marwa and Musawa in general, and Hala in particular, also in the sub-regional context where her work is, uh, is so important. So I apologize for leaving you, but I have to answer post facto questions in writing, Huda, if you de deem of this course. appropriate. Yes. And I hope this was a useful addition to the reflection webinar. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you, Nahla, for your time and for clearly laying out how uh, a, there is a vital role for uh, human rights instruments and uh, that inclusivity that we need to think about, both from our uh, approach towards what is seen as kind of inherently appropriate or culturally appropriate in the Islamic context, but also, you know, what is required from human rights instruments to understand uh, the international kind of organizations to understand about how to um, ask the questions and engage with the idea of faith and religion in order to ensure economic empowerment in its wider sense. Um, now I turn to Hala, and Hala, you've heard um, the, the, the impact uh, and the priorities mentioned by Nahla around the, the detrimental effects of economic disempowerment uh, for women. You as a uh, practitioner um, who, who sees um, these, uh, the, 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 the effects of economic disempowerment on the most more marginalized. What maybe perhaps you could share with us some of the hurdles that women have to navigate um, and the strategies they adopt to ensure that their livelihoods don't fall foul of any laws that may prevent them from, from working. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, glad to be here um, in such a great company. Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm quite pleased that actually Nahla raised the issue of Article 13. And um, it reminded me of an interesting story. I was doing a presentation uh, once about SIDU, um, and um, right next to me in the panel sat uh, a fantastic woman. She was uh, she's the leader uh, of the Women Street Vendor Cooperatives, and part of her presentation she was speaking about the importance of CDU and how CDU is so important to them as women street vendors. And one of the audiences he he raised his hand and he said, "Why don't you speak?" about things that matters to you, you know, and um, because he just assumed, you know, that a poor woman who's just 
selling tea by the side of the road, you know, she, what does she has to do with Sidu? You know, she must, and, 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 and so on. And so to their surprise, that woman, she started talking and she said, Sidu matters to me. We want to have access to resources. We want to have an education. We want to get into every aspects of employment. We don't want our daughters to continue to work as street vendors and to be suffering and, and, and struggle with poverty and so on. And so I could see that, you know, the man who asked the question, his face completely dropped. And that was a small winning moment for all of us is like, you know, um, um, so all those assumptions, you know, um, about women not knowing um, their rights. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the spreading and the domination of political Islam across the sub-Saharan Africa, where um, we have been working for over 20 years myself, you know, um, um, many governments and many communities have used religion um, to regulate um, women presence and women employment and access to resources. Um, and in many cases, um, there is a clear, so, so it's, a, it's a very conflicting relationship. So in one hand, you know, they are aware, you know, the actors, you know, um, um, of, uh, you know, within government and the political Islamists that they cannot actually um, uh, get rid of women. They need women, you know, within their economic framework. But on the other hand, you know, uh, because um, the heart of their ideology is based on, um, you know, suppressing women. This is what they use um, to appeal to society. You know, um, we are here to control women. We are here to discipline them. We are here to protect our societies from westernization and from all these outside culture. So what they do you know, they exercise massive suppression of women in, in public spaces. And this is a reality that we had to deal with in Sudan, in Somalia, and among Muslim communities in different parts of, uh, of the region, you know, in Ethiopia and, and, and so on. Um, so they make it really difficult for women to access certain economic activities. Um, like, you know, even activities that women has been doing for centuries. You know, uh, my grandmother has been uh, a trader. She owned um, um, uh, like a grind mill, you know, uh, and so is, you know, one of my other grandmother. She was uh, a market vendor. But right now, those type of trades, the comforts that you know, women existing within public space, they made it very difficult. So they come up with policies, they come up with laws that further impoverish women and push them to the margin and deprive them from accessing any resources. And I'll give you an example. In Sudan, for example, there is the, there is the policies that bans women from working as drivers of um, uh, uh, buses you know, and passenger cars. So if you are a woman, you cannot drive a bus. And this is basically the whole concept of, uh, of you know, um, wilaya, you know, like you can't be trusted, you know, to, to drive a bus that has a uh, uh, hundred of, of passengers, you know, and, and so on. And so they design this legal framework, like for example, the women street vendors are subjected to constant violations of dress code, acting immorally, laughing loudly, and, and all those things. And, and of course they are not, they can't have access to, uh, you know, to resources at the bank without collaterals and, and, and so on. So, um, so all these factors combined, it sends a message, you know, to the women that what you are doing is really, Terrible. We understand that you have to do it, but it's not really, um, you know, um, something that's appreciated by society. And it also sent to the uh, society a message that those women who are outside 
on the roads and things like that. You know, those are not how women should be. You know, so we are going to allow them, but we are going to, to give them hard time. So again, it's this grim, grim reality. Uh, women have been put in a dilemma of either accepting these injustices as part of their religion. This, because the, you see what they, what they were told, this is what the construct of political Islam works. This is what the Imam on Juma Friday see, said every Friday, you know, those women who are out there on the street. But on the other hand, the reality, the day-to-day -day reality, you know, women has to be out there. They have to work and, 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 and things like that. So this enduring challenge, you know, we are facing on a day-to-day -day, um, uh, basis to fight um, uh, for, for, for justice within, um, uh, within Islam and, and gender equality at the same time is such a difficult battle. And uh, you know, this is one of the things that she has been has been doing over the past um, how many years? I think you know um, we've learned a lot, you know, from employing the Musawa framework. We have learned a lot, you know, through our own experiences and through uh, you know engagement with um, uh, with academia and knowledge and you know our journal, which is being produced. I think now it's going to be the sixth issue, the Women in Islam journal that looks at the, um, you know, at the lived realities of women, you know, in um, um, in the in the Horn of Africa and their struggle, you know, as Muslim women between their identity and the requirements of, um, you know, of, of of them being alive and earning a living and accessing resources and so on. So um, it's a, it's it's a complex reality mm -hmm. that um, that women are navigating um, um, in in our part uh, of the world. I will stop here, and uh, you know, waiting for um, you know for further questions. Yeah. Thank you, Hala. That was both heartbreaking and inspiring at the same time. I think it's what you have laid out very clearly is. Um, the theoretical and legal uh, concepts that uh, both Ziva and Marwa have explained, and the fact that what happens when the man can't provide? What happens when there is a there's no man? Um, and what happens if we question this assumption that gender roles are um, uh, mediated through a patriarchal lens? And where do women who who have to work or want to work um, find a place of safety to do that? without having to compromise either their safety or their faith or their families. And I'm really glad to hear that it's uh, edition number six. I was there for edition number one when it was first launched. So it's wonderful that you continue to con um, work in the way that you do and uh, um, support the many women um, that, that work, put themselves every day on the front line to ensure that their survival and that of their families. Um, Ziba, you kind of tantalizingly uh, proposed a solution to these enraging um, problems that have been identified. Um, and uh, Hala also alluded uh, to a potential way forward that we could um, adopt in trying to navigate the claim that um, a particular patriarchal interpretation of, uh, of, of the faith is more authentic um, and, uh, and sacred. So what, what do you propose we can do? You're on mute, Luziba. Sorry, uh, can someone share my uh, first slide? The solution is actually the, um, because what the Hala was talking about is what we felt that Mus when Musawa came into existence. On the one part, you know, we were denied equality, justice in the name of Islam and human dignity. On the other hand, uh, we were the, when we came, we came into existence, it was after 9-11-2001. And that was the time that human rights was used as an instrument of what we could see as neo-colonial uh, project. You know, Afghanistan was um, um, uh, invaded and all this, you know, happening. So for us, 
the, the realization was that we need to bring this to framework, Islamic legal framework and human rights law and legal framework, because human rights is evolving and Islamic legal tradition is evolving. So we started um, uh, by doing research. With, uh, activists and as well as with, with the scholars, bring them together because for us, we realize that knowledge is important. Why? Because they use the knowledge of Islam through a patriarchal lens in order to deny us dignity and rights that we believe that we had in Islam. And the first thing that we did, we really tried to understand where do these laws come from? So we came up with the clarification of concepts. And of course, we take a feminist approach, but work with an Islamic framework. And we see no problem. Can we go back to the other slide, please? And we see no problem. Uh, no contradiction between Islam and human rights. So what we did, uh, can we go to the first slide, please? Yes. What we did was basically uh, demystify. We made a distinction between Sharia. Sharia in Muslim concept, in Muslim tradition is sacred. And it is a path to justice. But what we understand of Sharia is always an understanding. And the term Sharia in the Quran is never used, used only once, but never in the sense of law. So th the meaning of Sharia, the concept of Sharia that is common in the Muslim world is not Quranic. It was developed through the history. And that is the history of Islamic jurisprudence, which is fiqh. And fiqh literally means an understanding. And by and it came into existence more than 100 years after the death of the problem, prophet. And by that time, women's voices were silenced. They were put aside from the production of knowledge, so their interests were not there. So another concept that we used was the Islamic law, because the laws that we have on marriage and divorce and family law and inheritance are claimed to be based on Islam. But in fact, these laws are based on fiqh and they are codified in our time. And there have been changes, there have been reforms and everything. And so that clarity of concept for us was very important. And then we developed a holistic framework in the sense that we work with an Islamic legal tradition we work within human rights uh, tr uh, tradition and also lived reality, which is approach to the text. Our understanding of the legal tradition always comes from the lived reality. And the fourth one is the state law. So that is the holistic um, uh, framework that uh, we develop. So can we go to the next one? And what you see here are the knowledge briefs that we um, provided, you know, to demystify uh, what is CEDO, what is equality in Muslim law and all this. Yes, uh, the third one, yes. Uh, another one. Okay. Yes. And so this holistic framework that we have, we have four corners. And we think of a law uh, the, what you see in, uh, in inside this um, four corners is a sign of musawa, which means equality. So what we are looking for is equality. So what we want to do is to bring these four corners into conversation. Why? Because we know that when we talk about Islamic teaching, there is a plurality of understanding. You have um, patriarchal interpretation, you have egalitarian interpretation. And now there is actually a reformist tradition and Islamic feminism is part of that reformist that, uh, that uh, does not see uh, human rights or feminism as an alien concept, but actually understands it within the Islamic tradition. And then when we go to the lived reality, law, um, you know, there is unwritten law. 
And this unwritten law is also comes from culture and cultural understanding of tradition. So we also produce knowledge there, understand it. And then the, we have the constitutional guarantees because in most of the constitution, uh, in constitutions of most of Muslim laws, the principle of equality is accepted. But when it comes to family law and women, then there are some exceptions. And then finally, the human right. And um, the human right gives us a language. A language, and at, I was so happy to hear Hala talking about it. Because uh, most of the time, people think that human right is an elitist concept. And it is only um, uh, elites or so-called westernized women use it which is not in fact not now because human right is based on the concept of human dignity which is translated in legal matters and we have human dignity karama as the basis and all humans are equal in the eyes of the god so why shouldn't we try to create laws that treat us as equal human beings and this is this is really this framework that we work which is a holistic framework and uh, we also produce knowledge knowledge from within our first project was on Kawama and Velaya understand it and offer an alternative uh, interpretation and under, uh, understanding of it construct of it and our current project is uh, on Adl and Ihsan in Muslim marriages, on justice and beauty in Muslim marriages. And why we moved from that uh, to the uh, area of ethics, because the dominant ethics that we have are patriarchal ethics. And we need actually to reclaim Islam's egalitarian sp spirit. So the way that we can do it is really recover the ethical uh voice of our tradition and also to show how knowledge and production of religious knowledge interacts with politics and insert women's voices in the production of religious knowledge and take us as equal this is a process i'm not saying that everything will be solved because patriarchy this construct that we have came in history. It took ages, centuries for it to come. And if you look at men in charge, you can see how the concept of Bawama was built. And this one is also a process, but it has started. It has started before us and we are building of the work of others. And we are hoping that this is something that um, truly um, reflects the spirit of Islam. Thank you, Ziba. That was really, really clear. And I love the idea of how these four concepts um, that are, are, are reflected in, in the kite model really do not, um, are not framed as this kind of opposing alternative perspectives. In fact, they are brought into conversation for a common goal and a common good. And I think that is a, a really profound way of seeing these old age uh, arguments about the role of a secular human rights framework and a religious one. And can, can the human rights space engage with faith in any way and vice versa? So I think it's a, a really um, a clear example of how we can look at the different levers of influence um, on our lives um, and our belief systems and ideologies um, in, in bringing them in line with each other. Thank you for, for setting that out so clearly. Um, I think Marwa, you um, kind of alluded earlier to the examples where this perhaps model may have uh, you know, started um, um, or maybe is being practiced and some countries where a variation in the concept of equality uh, with particular with regards to Muslim family laws may be already happening. So please do let us um, share with us what you know. Yes, of course. So <clears throat> I ended with this uh, miserable slide where we see that the last 25 countries really are unfortunately Muslim countries with Muslim family laws. 
Now, how can we transform this situation? And remember when I shared earlier this slide, the logic. So I want to look now at, a, at the interesting side of this question. When we look at religion from an egalitarian lens with egalitarian eyes, what kind of reforms can we create? What kind of reforms that we have actually created in reality that can lead us to women's economic empowerment in Muslim contexts? Now, it's very, I'm very happy to come after Dr. Ziba because what she's saying is that um, there is a difference between what is divine and what is human. There's a difference between human patriarchal understanding and human egalitarian understanding of religion, even though it is the same religion. And it's very important to be very clear on that point, because accordingly, we end up with laws and policies based on religion that either empower women economically or not. But what does that mean for us? It means that the process of choosing a certain interpretation from the jurisprudence books and putting it into our laws and policies is not a religious process. This is a very political process. Who decides which interpretation makes it to the law books? Whose interests get served through the law? Who gets the money through the law? Okay, and so it's a very political process. Religion is used in this process to serve certain ends and certain interests, and that needs to be very clear to us. Now, there's a new body of religious knowledge that is egalitarian, gender egalitarian, that sees women as equal citizens, that sees women as um, equal bearers of the responsibility within the family. People, women are also, like men, should be enjoying equal rights. This body of religious knowledge, surprise, surprise, is now becoming reflected into our Muslim family laws recently. There are many reasons for that. The economic cost of the old ways, the noise that women's movements are making, you know, the halabaloo, and, and all, which is very, very important. I'm going to come to that. But let me give you a taster of examples of some of these law reforms that have actually happened in our Muslim family laws. And these are Muslim family laws that we are often told they're divine. You know, you can't touch them. These are the word of God. If you touch them, you're going to be going against God and you're going to, you know, whatever, suffer all ways of suffering if you do so. But reality is telling us, yeah, the reality is telling us that these laws are not divine and they are actually changing when there is political will by the state, when it is actually beneficial for the state to change them, when the women's movements are making it very costly for the state not to change them. So, for example, Morocco. Remember in my previous slides when I showed you how obedience, the obligation of obedience of women to, to husbands and male guardians is actually hampering their right and access to work freely? Morocco removed all duty of obedience and male guardianship on women from the law in 2004. Jordan. Jordan recently removed the requirement of the male guardian's approval for some bank loans and transactions. Women there had to take the, the approval of the guardian. That was removed. Inheritance. And I see that uh, there's a question on it. Inheritance is a very, very sensitive issue. Let's look at what Tunisia did. Tunisia recently, there are now, um, it has stalled a bit, but Tunisia is in the process of changing their inheritance laws, Muslim inheritance laws, to enable both women and men to inherit equally. In contexts where this has been very, very difficult, like in Egypt and Jordan, for example, recent laws have been passed where punishments are being made, uh, promulgated against those who deprive women of their shares in the inheritance. Now, what about matrimonial assets? Let's look at Morocco and Malaysia, where they have very interesting solutions and legal regimes to enable women to have a share in their matrimonial assets that have been accumulating during the marriage using Islamic jurisprudence as an argument to justify these legal reforms. In Egypt recently, women heads of household have been recognized and can access social security services just are, as men. Can I interrupt you? Are you supposed to be moving slides or? I'm not. Uh Oh, okay. I'm not. I just want to show you this positive law development table later, Yanni. Oh, great. Yeah. Because this, this positive law development table 
does not focus only on the economics part of it, the economic empowerment, but on all other issues. But I want you to take a look at it after we're done. It's there on Musawa's website in both English and Arabic. And it shows that change is possible. These Muslim family laws actually are changing. We can change them. And we won't be heretics. We won't be blasphemous if we call for that. In fact, I claim that we would be coming even closer to the purposes of Sharia. Yeah. And so this is a political process. And I want to give you a couple of stories how these kinds of changes have happened in Muslim family laws in Morocco, 2004. The whole Muslim family law changed. But before 2004, for 20 years, the women's movement, the Moroccan women's movement has been working very, very hard to lobby to do research, to uh, mobilize, to work with the men, women on the ground. But they have not been able to change that family law for 20 years. Fast forward, uh, the old king, the previous king uh, dies, a new younger king comes to power. Still, the Muslim family law is not changing, even though he has a very modern vision for the new Morocco because it's a very sensitive issue. You cannot just change Muslim family law like this in these contexts. But then, 2003, something very important happened. The Casablanca terrorist bombings. And that was the chance where the 20 years of work by the Muslim, by the, by the women's movement, and the vision of the king came together and said, okay, this is not Islam. These terrorist bombings, they are not Islam. Islam is something different, and we're going to show you because we have a Muslim family law uh, that will reflect that modern face. And it was a political decision because Morocco at the time, there was new leadership. There was a keenness to show that Morocco is forward looking for many reasons. OK, so this is an example of a reform. Another one, for example, in Egypt, the law, which is the no fault divorce mechanism that women can go to court and ask for divorce without having to present any reasons for 10 years before 2001, when that law was passed, the women's movement has been working very hard. What happened is in 2001, Egypt was going to Geneva, actually, to go and discuss its um, uh, SIDA report. And the Egyptian government at the time under the Mubarak regime was very, very keen to show a modern face to the international community, because that also meant uh, aid, financial aid, and it meant a certain standing within the, 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 the Egypt, within the international community. Because of that, the Fukhula law was then promulgated to show the world that we in Egypt, we don't need to forget about our Islamic roots. We have solutions in our Islamic roots. But what, where was this 10 years before when the women's movement was talking about it? Another example in Tunisia, which I'm not going to go into, because, but I want to, I think you got the idea. It's a very, very political process where the four points of the kite that Ziba showed us come together, work together, play together, are balanced together. And a political moment has to happen and a political will needs to be there for that kind of reform to happen. I cannot overstate the importance of the women's movement in the fact that these changes eventually made it. Yeah. So I hope I've showed you that women's economic empowerment can happen through making certain reforms in Muslim family laws, even though we are being told that they are divine laws, but change is actually happening because as our motto in Musawa is, change is necessary, change is possible. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. That was really, really inspiring. And I think you're so right in um, kind of very highlighting how important it is to engage in in the spaces where women are told it is not for them. So the, the vitality and the, the commitment of the women's movement and the work they had done enabled them to seize the opportunities and create a foundation for these changes that were very much, as you outlined, very political and had material impact and difference on women's lives. Uh, thank you for really, really making it very clear that um, it is not about how Muslim or committed to the faith you are. It is whether you want to make it better for everybody else. That was very, very empowering to hear. Hala, do you have um, 
some examples of where, and particularly in the context of sub-Saharan Africa and the, or the Horn of Africa right now, where these political shifts are happening and the experiences of women on the ground and the women's movement have, have led to a, 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 a moving of the needle, um, a, of a shift in the debate, and how has that translated practically for women? Particularly, the, you know, I keep thinking about the woman you mentioned, who was the head of the union of the tea workers, um, street vendors, and I, and how uh, relevant her voice is. Where does that? Where would she? Where would she say things are happening right now? Thank you, Huda. Well, you know, just to continue where Marwa has stopped. Um, well, I came from a country uh, where women they fight every day. You know, and, and I'd like to extend my solidarity to you know, you know my you know my sisters in Sudan who are right now in the streets fighting for democracy, um, but also fighting for their own existence. They are fighting for for their rights. They are fighting for their dignity, as Ziba said. You know. Um, and they're fighting for, you know, for the human rights, you know, as, as human beings. And, uh, you know, they're doing that this against all odds, you know, um, and, and which is quite amazing, you know, looking at a society that has been dictated and controlled by political and militant Islam for over 30 years, what this has done, actually, you know, it exposed clearly to uh, to women, you know, and, and I do remember that, you know, how when we started the conversations using the Musawa framework and talking about, you know, there is no contradiction of being Muslim, but at the same time, you know, justice and equality, you know, on the contrary. And right now, the conversation become much easier, you know, and it's, um, you know, the whole, um, you know, the whole, uh, like idea and structure, it became very clear, especially when it comes to, you know, younger women, a new generation of women who clearly, um, they don't buy, you know, into that um, narrative, you know, and into that rhetoric that, you know, uh, Islam is based on, um, you know, it, it's about Islam for women to be repressed and to be alienated and, and you know, and to be treated unfairly. So, it's, uh, you know, um, as, as Ziba said and Marwa also said that change is, change is quite possible, but also, you know, it, it's not going to be easy because also the patriarchal institution is really defending itself, you know, um, and the structure that benefits from the alienation of women, it's really complex extremely complicated and and this is what we are finding ourselves up against you know within the women movement you know that um unless we really understand first our political power and weight you know um as citizens and um, you know and as capable human beings of influencing change um it will be really difficult i think we are there uh, but as I said, you know, it's, it's not an easy battle. I mean, uh, what I want to say that, you know, the circle that was built around women, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where, um, you know, if you look at the, um, at the UN, UNDP, they are saying like 80% of women in sub-Saharan Africa, they are actually operating within the informal um, sector. So, so that means, you know, there is less women that have access to education or formal training and, and that they were really caught in this um, cycle of operating in um, a sector that is not recognized and yet they are exposed into more uh, repression. Um, let alone the whole issue of, and I'm talking, sorry, when I say Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm talking about, you know, you know what I'm talking about, but particularly the countries that we are working on, you know, Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, Somalia, and, and, and so on. But so, so majority of, of the women, they are forced to exist within that 
uh, within that um, um, sector. And then they are quite exposed, not to the violence, but also exposed you know, to the ideas of and the ideology of militant Islam, who make them feel guilty about their existence outside of the home and their work practice and, and things like that. And so limiting them. So it's a combination of you know, um, militant ideology, economic exploitation, and, and, and so on. And they were kept at the bottom of the chain of the, um, of the, of the economic um, sequence. So it's, um, and I've seen women, for example, who were selling um, uh, falafel on the street for over um, 25 years, but they never owned a shop. You know, or, um, uh, or or they were selling tea by the side of the road, but they never had a cafe. You know, and that clearly speaks to the fact that you know um, um, the whole um, issues of Kwama and Wilaya that obstruct their access, you know, to resources. Um, the situations within their family law where they have to live in. Um, often in very repressive situation and things like that. So what we did, you know, is we tried to create those platforms of women cooperatives, which is a combination of, you know, um, social and economic rights, but at the same time, it's platform for awareness and for movement building. Because, um, you know, when, when you are working with women, when you're working with women, majority Muslim population, you, you cannot actually, you know, put things into separate boxes, you know, so, so the intersectionality between women economics and social rights and human rights and access to justice, it's all intertwined and it has to come together and their own peace and security and safety, it's all highly interconnected. So the experiment of forming the women cooperatives, uh, which we have tried it in Sudan, we have tried it in Uganda, we have tried it in um, um, Somaliland, in Hargeza. It was amazingly successful to the point that we were, you know, ourselves, we were really taken by surprise because you just open window, you know, and, and you start you know, having this conversation and organizing these sessions, you know, for with the women that what they were doing is um, it's their right and it should be better. And, and you link it to their economy, you link it to their livelihood, to their livelihood, you know, and at the same time, you know, showing them as Muslim women that they are doing the right thing that this is what exactly they should be doing is to fight for their dignity and you know and that how islam honored them you know it's it's amazing you know the outcome of 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 these experiments despite of course as i said you know the complexity of um you know what we are and they are you know um all up against in terms of um you know the backlash and and and, and so on uh, but but I think you know as I said you know um, that it's it's and I would say that again it's very very important for the women you know and for the women within the women movement you know if we really want to accomplish change you know to uh, understand very well our political you know weight you know and to uh, start uh, working through that and utilizing that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think what's really powerful is the how um, the, the kite model and, and the, the engagement um, of these different perspectives, um, particularly the lived realities of women, does really illustrate the potential for change. And, you know, I'm struck by by the, the, what you said around the, uh, the, the, the length of time women have been doing this work and remaining in precarious and unsafe conditions, even though, so it is not, it's not even economic empowerment, what they're doing is subsistence. And I think that's really clear from the fact that um, what Marwa said about the cost of patriarchy economically, um, it, it is, it creates this kind of drive and a push to go for a more egalitarian lens and interpretation. So thank you for clearly spelling that out. We have, we're running out of time, but we have, I think, 10 minutes for questions. And um, I think we already have three questions that are 
um, that are, oh, we have more uh, that are being lined. But I wanted um, to kind of put it perhaps, maybe if I put them um, to, uh, to, to, to direct them to you personally, and perhaps if anybody wants to share or respond, please let me know. But I was going to um, uh, put this question from Aysel, I think, uh, um, in Turkey, um, to Ziba, who, think, who was talking about inheritance and the sharing between men and women with family members. Um, is there an equal way of, of reinterpreting the inheritance laws so that they become um, not um, uh, subject to the concept of Qiwama and Wilaya. And I think perhaps Ziba and maybe Marwa want to uh, respond. Yes, I will be brief. There is an equal way. And this equal way is actually exists from the very beginning. Because uh, when you look at the Quranic verses, and this is now understood that there is actually no difference. Uh, gender is not a factor. What is the factor there is justice and an equitable distribution according to the condition of the time. And in fact, I would say the first person who worked on this and proposed the framework for egalitarian was um, uh, uh, the uh, Tunisian uh, scholar, uh, uh, Tahir no, Haddad, yes, Tunisian scholar Tahir Haddad, and he did that in 1930. Mm -hmm. And the book that he published on women's rights in Islam, in Sharia and in our society was banned in Tunisia. And he was a scholar and he was put aside. So the problem is not the Quran. The problem is not text, but the problem is the context within which this text is understood. And also the, um, the resistance to it. There is a lot of resistance to inheritance, exactly because it touches on power, on economic power. And therefore, in some Muslim contexts, it is an anatoma. You can't even talk about it. But in Morocco, the debate has started. In Tunisia, the debate has started. And the scholarship has been produced. And we have part of this scholarship in Musaba that you can access. Excellent. Thank you. Marwa, do you have a? Yes, sure. So um, there's a lot of work that has been done on this, where we can actually end up with a very egalitarian sharing of resources in inheritance between women and men. and. Uh, it's important for us to know that the principle of a man gets double the share of a woman was in a particular situation between siblings. That was then taken and made as the principle governing the whole inheritance structure between all women and all men. That is a juristic human decision. That does not come from the text, okay? The text says one, one thing. Now, I want to give you a very quick example where the Egyptian government in the 40s, 1940s, realized that following the text, you know, word by word, would have ended up in an unjust situation, not because the text itself was unjust, but because the text was used in ways in Islamic legal history that would have, the way they engage with the text would have created this injustice. It, it, it's, it's related to a situation where there is um, a grandfather, a father, and a grandson, and the father dies, whereas the grandfather is still alive. Mm -hmm. When the grandfather dies, that poor grandson would not inherit anything if we had followed the text in the same way that the jurists followed it. So the Egyptian government decided that to make use of al wasiyah uh, t t testament, a will, having a will, yeah, which was there in the Quranic text mm -hmm. and created this new invention called al wasayya al wajiba, the obligatory will that the state actually does on behalf of the deceased. Mm -hmm. What is this? This is a political intervention mm -hmm. in the reading of the text because there was a decision that this is unjust. We, and, and the text gives us a way out. It gives us a solution. So let's do it as a government. Mm. What happened is that the remaining Arab governments took it and put it in their laws eventually. Wow. Yes. So the inherent 
inheritance, which is a big taboo. No, no, we can't touch it. No, we're touching it. Governments do touch it and they provide solutions from within the text. Right. I have. That's really helpful. Uh, Shireen uh, wants to ask you, do you have a written piece on the effects of Muslim family laws and women's economic opportunities? Is there, um, you know, is there, a, is there some resource she can turn to that you may have and share with us around that? I, so the Jadalia article that I'm sorry I'm saying that I'm the one who wrote. I, I, you should not refer to yourself, Yanni, really. But no, there no, is, you need to because you're the only one who's written it. So yes, yes. that's the problem. When I actually tried to write this article, I really struggled to find adequate resources. So I please do read that article and please add to it and expand it. We need more and more people. Great, thank you, Hala. I wanted to ask you a question that's not necessarily in uh, uh, has been posed by the audience, but I think many people are, are kind of it sets the context to to what we're talking about today. Why why should we talk about religion and and faith when it comes to economic empowerment in this in a CSW kind of forum? Like, what is the role of God in this, and why? Like, are we what, what's the use? How does it change women's lives? Well, you know, um, such a philosophical question, you know, um, I mean, it has everything to do with our life, you know, with our identity and who we are. I've been asked these questions a number of times, you know, um, as someone who was um, actually, you know, uh, come out of, uh, of the women movement and the secular women movement and, uh, I still, to a large extent, I consider myself, you know, as um, 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 a Muslim woman, but also secular, and I don't see any contradictions um, uh, between between both. But um, and I remember sometimes when I I post a statement and I talk about um, any issue, let's say, you know, um, issues of adultery or um, you know, and. Uh, and, and we want the activists within the community to sign for it. And they will say, we will sign, you know, secular activists, but we have to remove all the codes that's actually related to religion, you know, because religion has nothing to do with this. Um, and, and, and so, uh, and I think when you uh, confront women, even the activist women, and we had this conversation and all of us, and, and, and you just, talk about the fact that you know if we look at ourselves and measure our access to wealth you know regardless of how much privileged we are among other women we are still extremely poor we're very very poor you know muslim women and muslim who live under Muslim laws and women who live under Muslim laws. We are extremely uh, poor because we are constrained by um, an assume by an ideology that assume that women should receive less um, at all level, um, less than men. And, and 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 the fact that you know the, the construct assume that we don't deserve you know to have the money. Um, and so I I think you know it's impossible to talk about economic empowerment uh, without talking about you know the current construct that we are living within um, as as Muslim women. Thank you. That was really very clear, and I think it 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 um, gave me a good understanding and a grounding why why uh, talking about um, religion in this space is actually part of fighting patriarchy, um, because that's in a sense the tool that is used and excused, particularly in your example of when you talk about uh, the street vendors being harassed, being told that they are not proper women, that they are laughing too loudly. All of these things come from the, the view that religion regulates these things and a particular form of interpretation, which um, uh, Ziba mentioned in terms of how, and then also how um, Marwa really tied that in, in by saying what particular uh, interpretation is given power and chosen over others. And so I think that really, really uh, illustrates it very, very clearly to me. Um, I think um, we are, have run out of time. I think we believe I'm, we're six minutes over. Thank you so much for 
for your time with us today. I think you have all added um, to a really rich conversation that I think will continue um, to, to kind of take place and to evolve. I think the, the experiences that everyone has brought uh, today really shed light on a holistic kind of intersectional approach to dealing with um, uh, uh, financial empowerment and economic empowerment for women. Um, and I hope that the, um, uh, the, the participants in the webinar found it very useful. Certainly there's been very interesting chat um, around the issues that you all posed. Um, thank you all for uh, attending today. Please do look out at our social media channels for a recording of this um, uh, of this webinar and the uh, references uh, mentioned and the resources mentioned. Thank you again to my esteemed panel. Um, I thank you for your time and your emotional labor and engaging with the work that you have uh, done with us today. Thank you very much and thank you all for coming. Wishing you a very good rest of day, wherever you may be. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.